So let's get into a little bit more. Because I want to show how pervasive this problem is of integrated hypocrisy. Because there's an undercurrent, like a cause for it. Which is really an inability, just like the Bible says, an inability to understand spiritual things. Well, yeah, if you're busy looking at your wife and not God, Adam, and you prefer the wife in the flesh you got standing there to God you only see, as it were, as the Bible puts it, in the breeze of the evening, breeze of the day, which is the evening. Um... You're gonna, you're gonna start, it's gonna influence the way you think, period. All of your thought processes are gonna go through, as it were, the flesh, and you're not gonna have any kind of vertical component as a result of choosing the woman over God. So in order to understand, interpret, analyze anything, you're going horizontal to try to understand the vertical. Well, that's going to lead to some pretty cuckoo ideas. Even if you're trying to understand God. Even if you want Him. If you're going through the horizontal to understand the vertical. Instead of just looking up vertically at the ceiling and saying, Hi, I want to know you. If you try some other method, you're going to come up with garbage. But it's not merely garbage. There's where the other thing comes in. The negative attitude that Adam had to have in order to choose a woman over God. There is a negativity, a distinct disdain against God and all vertical ideas of what have to end up being called spirituality because we don't know what else to call it. It's built into all of our concepts of anything vertical, not merely God. Now, the evidence that this is true is just all over the place. Look at every single sci-fi movie ever made. Okay? There's a, a ton of evidence that what our ideas of otherworldliness are are just really just changes of skin. Okay? Changes of cultural habits. You know, Star Wars was a big blockbuster movie, okay? But they were basically all really living like humans do, except they had green skin or they looked more like animals. And maybe they breathed a different oxygen. You know, they breathe some kind of other kind of, you know, methane or whatever was the way they breathe. But they breathe. In other words, all of our ideas about what constitutes otherworldly are really just, what do you want to call it, permutations of the way we live down here. I'm not the only one to notice this, okay? But now take that same idea and poured it over to all of the religions and all of the religious ideas and all of the ideas that we show in our public media. And it's really helpful, you know, to look at TV here. TV, movies. I mean, you know, to a certain extent in writing, you know, Ray Bradbury stuff, Frank Herbert in particular, he's really good at showing this. Um, if you take otherworldly and the whole God concept thing in our literature, in specifically movies and TV, because that appeals to the masses, so it tells you what the masses like and what the masses buy into. Notice how a person who believes in a God concept of any kind or the supernatural is goofball. Notice how worship is always depicted as some kind of mindless ritual where you count beads or you chant 
or you sit still and you stand up and you sit down and you stand up and you sit down. Or you walk slowly and wear funky clothes. And you talk like this of the Holy One. Like, you know, what do you want to call it? Zombies. Pretty much, the, the message you're sold is that if you believe in some kind of God or gods or supernatural persons who have, you know, some kind of affair, some you know, some kind of relationship to your life down here, that in order to relate to those people, persons, gods, that you have to have this mindless ritual full of all kinds of goofy behavior and special clothing and special buildings too. With special chants and rituals. And it's all very mystical and you go through the motions and that's supposed to please this supernatural person. Now if somebody did that to you to get a favor from you, wouldn't you be turned off? If somebody knocks on my door and wants to borrow a cup of sugar and they do all this stand up, sit down, stand up, sit down and talking real flowery tones, I'm not going to want to give them the sugar. If they come straight to me with common sense and say, Hi, sorry, I ran out of sugar. Do you happen to have a spare cup of sugar in the house? I'd have to reply, No, I don't. I got brown sugar, which has been sitting in the back of my refrigerator for four years, but I really do. I, but I would answer them because they're asking me a normal, straightforward question. It's not barnacled with all this goofball junk. So in our sci-fi movies and in our depictions of religion, in other words, anything that's not grounded in the kitchen, the home, the workplace that we go to every day, anything bigger than that, we don't understand it. We can't process it. That's the first problem. We depict it in goofball terms because we don't know how to think about it. And it always manages to be that those goofball terms are deprecating of the object, whether it's a sci-fi object. I mean, how many cheesy sci-fi movies have been made? It's a sci you know, it's a deprecating of the object or a devaluation of the object. Oh, we'll see, they're just like us in some, you know, manner. Oh, green skin. Looks like a, you know, Star Wars animal you know like that sort of like giant squid guy who played the general in Star Wars 2 you know to try and fire on the Dark Star I mean we got we got really cheesy ideas about what you know beyond this world stuff ought to be it's cheesy and it's deprecating of the object they're just like us, except they're weird looking. And then serving God? Oh, wow, you know, it's got to be zombie movements. Which none of us would like if we were the object of those movements. Nobody likes a psychophant, unless you, you know, really have ego problems. Nobody likes obsequiousness, the Uriah Heep type from Charles Dickens' novel. Okay, nobody likes that. So why do we expect a god person or gods or supernatural beings who somehow have, you know, some influence over our lives, why do we expect them to like it? If they made us, we're like them. Okay, Bible even says that. Okay, would you like it if somebody was slavering to you? Not unless you had real bad ego problems like, you know, you're emotionally age five going on 50 chronologically. 
So what we treat God as if he's like that? So it, the hypocrisy is in part due to an inability to think. And when not thinking, when emoting, we just happen to invent the most nasty, puerile ideas of sci-fi or God along the way. Which means that really we're looking to put it down. Amazon women from Mars. Catwoman. The octopus from space. I mean, I was really big on sci-fi when I was a kid. I still am. Frank Herbert understood all that. He mixed the whole sci-fi genre with religion. He showed you how dumb it is. And really all it ends up being is a power play. Honey, if you got that much ability to make that, you know, like the Benny Tlilex. Okay, am I saying that right? You know, from the, from the Dune novels, all six of them. Really, just seeing one is not enough. You have to read all six. You know, if you got that kind of an ability, why are you busy fighting for power with somebody else? Man, I would take, if I had that kind of ability to make all those machines on X, which was the planet name, if I could do that, honey, I wouldn't want any power. Just let me buy a plot of land, okay, that's big enough where I can till the soil. And yeah, I need some money. Okay, you get some money, but you can make money in a lot of ways. You don't have to have power. And then, you know, I'll just use my goodies and live a good life. I don't want power over a whole bunch of other people. That's a pain in the neck. That's why I don't understand why God likes being God. I really don't. God, you got power over all of us. Why would you want that? What can we do for you? Not a thing. Of course, I'm talking to God like, you know, hello, he's a person. And he has, as it were, and this is the thing that kills me the most, he has shackled his own life to ours. I don't understand why he likes that. I really don't, to this day. Every day I get up, I think, why, why, why? Oh God, I wouldn't, I wouldn't create, period. But he really does have a parental attitude about it. He's not doing it to have power over. He's doing it to, to raise us up. And we know that from a bazillion Bible verses. You know, Isaiah 54, whole chapters. Isaiah 54, Isaiah 55, Ephesians 1, 15 through 23, Ephesians 3, 15 through, what was it, 19? We're just talking about building his thinking in us to raise us up, to make us gods. Ye are gods. What was that? John 10, 34, quoting Psalm 82, which is mistranslated. I had to create a whole Vimeo channel on that. God's out to, to make us like him so that we can enjoy the way he does. To make us high. But see, we won't understand and appreciate and enjoy being high until we've had enough taste of what it's like to be low. He started the angels out at the opposite end, just one notch below God, because anything that God creates is going to be below him. So, okay, fine. I'll make angels one notch below. Compared to us, the angels are the gods. And we even call them that. That's what the Bible uses as a term for it. Beneha Elohim. Elohim. The sons of God. Because well, they really are. So are you. God makes everybody directly. Every soul he makes directly. That's not at all like. Our depictions of. Sci-fi. Or otherworldliness. Or spirituality. Which is basically you know, religified into a zombieism. Of one kind or another. Some Tibetan 
chant. Or something baloney like that. They're all into the whole Tibetan thing. It's completely zombified. But so is all Hinduism. Pouring liquid butter called ghee on a wooden statue that's like 30 feet high. That somehow makes sense? Really? Letting cows walk through the streets when you're starving? Oh, cause they're, 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 they're holy. Huh? What kind of a God would create a lifestyle like that? What kind of a God would create rules like that? And nobody has caught on until yet that I can find that the Mosaic Law itself was a parody of all that nonsense. A parody. Yeah, you went through rituals. Yeah, you went through movements. Yeah, you sacrificed animals. But did you ever stop to link up the meaning of the doctrine underneath the motions? Because when you do, you realize that God is making fun of the motions. It's a satire. The whole Mosaic Law is a satire on religion. And the idea of going through the motions is high. This is what all the Goyim are doing. This is what the Goyim are doing. They're going through these motions for nothing. And so I'm going to make you go through the motions too to realize how stupid they are. And oh, by the way, I'm God, I'll make good on it anyhow. Just read. Just read the book. I never heard anybody, including my own pastor, Explain. Oh, by the way, Mosaic Law is a satire on religion. Because everybody was doing those same motions in the pagan nations. And so to make fun of them, the Jews go through the same motions and at the same time, while they're going through them, they're supposed to realize, hi, this isn't doing anything for God. That was the whole point of it. Yes, you go through the motion, you slit the throat of the animal. Does God actually eat the animal? Think about the whole ritual now. Does God actually eat it at the end? Oh no. The priest gets some, you get some, and the rest gets burnt. And what is it called? A soothing aroma. Okay, but God doesn't need the aroma. Who is it soothing to? And who's smelling it? You are. The priest is. God's not. God doesn't have a body. Doesn't need one. So it's a satire. To call it a soothing aroma to God, and that's a refrain in the Old Testament. That's a satire. God doesn't need the smell. God doesn't need the animal killed. God doesn't need you being a good little boy or girl. So if these rules exist, maybe they have a different reason. And how many people are ever thinking about that? Well, maybe because, I don't know, I just ask questions all the time. That's the kind of stuff that hit me from the get-go. I'm not smarter or better than somebody else. It's just, I looked at those movements, and I know a lot of atheists do too. And they say, huh? What what kind of God would want you to slit the throat of an animal in order to appease him? Answer, logically, no God. And so the atheist says, Hi, if you're going to tell me that this God that you believe in wants you to slit an animal to appease him, then I don't believe in your God. And that is what we tell the atheist. And we're dead wrong. That's not why it's there. It's there to show that it cannot, cannot, cannot slitting the throat of an animal or you dying or you suffering or even Christ dying and suffering can not appease God. That's the whole point of it. And that's exactly what Moses was explaining in Deuteronomy 30. The Jews, when they got the law, they said, What's this? What are we going to do? We're going to send up to heaven to have somebody explain how to follow this law. 
Are we going to send somebody down to the, 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 the down to Hades to explain this law to us? No, you're supposed to think about it. And when you think about it, you conclude, oh, it's a satire. It can't be anything but a satire. Because if there's a real God, he is not pleased by you suffering. There is nothing you can sacrifice to give him that's going to do him a lick of good. Might do you some good. Might do the guy next door to you some good. But it ain't doing nothing for him. Duh! Duh! That's what you were supposed to conclude. And then, when you went through those rituals, you'd be laughing your head off inside. <laughs> oh, I sin and I get dinner. That's what all the rituals mean. All the animal sacrifices. If you sin, you got meat. Because that was the law. When you sin, you sacrifice an animal, you have to eat some, and the priest eats some, and the rest gets burnt because it depicts what? The future God-man voluntarily going to the cross. It's not depicting the animal. The animal isn't doing anything for God. It's all like a little play. To depict something that nobody's going to see in the future. So it's a satire on works. It's a satire on sacrifice. It's a satire even on sin. Hi, I sin, I get dinner. Well then, you know, since meat is so hard to come by in the ancient world, you were rich if you had ten cows. And let's sin more often. Because God says only blemishless animals can be brought to you. And hi, I don't know how to make a blemishless animal. So God, you're going to have to make a lot of blemishless animals. Because you know what? I'm going to sin. A lot. Because I like the way meat smells and tastes. It's a soothing aroma to me. And every time I sin, I have to take an animal to the priest. That's what you say in your law. Yeah, it is what he said. So you sin, you get me. Aren't you going to want to sin? Everywhere from Dan in the north to Bathsheba in the south. When anybody traversed Israel, they would smell meat all over the place. That would have made Israel automatically more famous than all the surrounding nations and would have created so much interest. People would go there just so they could smell the meat because that's usually as close as most people even got to meat. Except maybe once or twice or three times a year during their, you know, their holy orgies. Then you got to have a little hunk of meat. Israel had to have it every day. Satire. But we we look at the Mosaic line, we don't get that. Oh no. We zombify it. The Jews zombified the law. They still do. Bobbing in front of the wailing wall. Bobbing in front of the wailing wall. Adonai Lohenu Adonai Rav. Baruch Atoy Adonai because they think that if they go through those motions and wear that sit sit, those little tassels beneath their coats with the big hats and the curly cues called PS. Oh, well, that's being holy to God. Really? And where does that say so in the Bible? Nowhere. But it's not the Bible we're following, is it? We hear a couple of words in scripture and then off goes our imagination just like with those cheesy sci-fi movies. And the Catholic version is no better, which passes itself off as Christian. I'm not saying the Catholics aren't Christians. You're a Christian if you believe Christ paid for your sins. But come on. And, you know, not to leave them out, the Protestants aren't any better. Everybody comes up with some kind of goofball 
cheesy sci-fi like 1950s B movie sci-fi idea of how you know it is for God to be God. Kind of like the stupid movie Contact, one of the dumbest movies ever made. Ah, throw up just to think about it. Little balls of light. Oh, and then all of a sudden you're back, and nobody believes you. Honey, if that's what it means to be supernatural, nobody's going to want to be supernatural. Cartoony. You get the point? Integrated hypocrisy is deprecating of everything. But the large reason why is we can't read, we can't think, we can't process data, we can't analyze. So we just like imagine. And since the sin nature is controlling the whole thing and the foundation of the sin nature is choosing the woman, a human, over God, therefore our imagination without us even knowing it zombifies sci-fi and you know, the supernatural, God, which is a way to deprecate, to put it down. So do you wonder why the atheist is an atheist? I don't. I mean, their arguments are pretty stupid, no offense. Not all the time stupid. Nobody's 100% stupid. But if they're busy looking at what we say the God concepts are, why aren't they going to reject it? And why the hell, when we actually do believe in Christ and have a spiritual life, why aren't we using 1 John 1 9 when we read the Bible? That we're not is demonstrated by all the cheesy sci fi movies and all the cheesy Bible movies, because there ain't never been one yet made that, golly, if it's 50% sensible, I'll need to shoot myself. Think about it.